The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Nazareth, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord for your servant is listening. May we listen for the presence of the creator and redeemer and sustainer. Amen. When I was a kid and we went to visit my grandparents' house at the holidays in Springfield, Ohio, my two brothers and I would always bunk together in my aunt's childhood bedroom with her, and God bless her to this day. We were generally given free reign to run and explore and play with anything in their amazing house. The great thing about growing up as the second kid is that most, maybe not if all of the rules that we had growing up, came up in response to my brother's immense energy and curiosity. He was taught how to read a clock at the age of three and my parents put a post-it note next to the clock with a guide about what numbers had to be visible for him to wake them up. <laughs> At my grandparents' house, the big rule I remember was that we were not allowed to play with my aunt's collection of glass horses, which happened to be in the room where we all slept. <laughs> I think you all see where this might be going. I remember being half asleep at four or five years old, and I wasn't even tall enough then to touch those horses, so I was not concerned. And in the wee hours of the morning, witnessing my brother sneaking back and forth between his bed and the shelf with the horses, hearing something break, and then hearing him wake up my aunt saying, Tonta, I think there's something wrong with one of your horses. And she'd roll over and tell him to go back to his sleep. So we'd get back in bed and then go to the shelf. It would happen again. I'd go back to my aunt's bed and tell her again, I think there's something wrong with one of your horses. And she'd tell him to go back to sleep. And the cycle would continue until she finally said something along the lines of, go lie down, and if there's something wrong with the horse, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. No, it didn't happen quite like that. but. I think it was closer to, if you broke one of the horses, you'll need to take responsibility for it in the morning. When sitting with the story of the calling of Samuel as a prophet, I couldn't help but see Samuel as my pesky older brother, keeping us all up with his glass horse races, recognizing that something was happening and changing, but not fully yet clear of the events or consequences that lay on his shoulders. I appreciate that the reading for today names that the word of the Lord, Lord was rare in those days, and visions were not yet widespread. 
When Samuel gets up each time, he's convinced that Eli is the one calling him, initially unaware that God might be calling him after all. And while it may be easy to become annoyed with either Samuel for his pesky persistence, or with Eli for pulling the covers over his head and turning over initially rather than giving the boy the attention and care he needed. There is something so deeply powerful about Eli's guidance to Samuel. Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And while it takes a couple attempts, in these words, Samuel, Eli gives Samuel the incredible agency in helping him understand how to hear and receive God's word. There is meant responsibility and weight in that call that is occurring. And Eli could easily try to interfere to witness God himself but instead he empowers Samuel to receive that call. And when Samuel does receive the prophecy from God, it includes some very hard and challenging news for Eli's house. Even in the reading, we hear that what's about to happen will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. The role of a prophet is deeply complex and challenging, and the news often is not received as good news for the many that hear it. I appreciate that we're hearing the call of the prophet Samuel the day before we honor the legacy and life of the prophet Martin Luther King Jr. In his volumes of sermons, Strength to Love, King preached that the ultimate, ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. Often King's prophecy and words that get the most attention, airtime, and Instagram likes are the more gentle, light, hope-filled words. And I appreciate this quote as it reminds us that our work as Christians is messy and challenging and controversial and inconvenient. Prophets so powerfully are able to sit in the muddy chaos with God and then able to step into the place of sharing that witness and vision with communities who might not receive it well. In both the case of Samuel and Dr. King, we see the necessity of interdependence, of having others who help them in the midst of their immense responsibility. Eli's empowerment and willingness to receive Samuel's prophecy, even though it meant difficulty for his house, is powerful. Eli's response being, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him, rather than arguing with it. Last year, on Martin Luther King Day, the city of Boston unveiled a 20-foot-tall statue titled The Embrace, of two hands embracing one another based on a photo of Dr. King embracing his wife, Coretta Scott King, after he won the Nobel Prize in 1964. Unlike many of the other heroic images and statues of King standing on his own, this statue represents the deep importance of intimacy, vulnerability that it takes for collective action and change that King's legacy and prophecy is not just of his own doing, but also the work of the witnesses that received his prophecy, whose ears were open to hear God at work through King's witness and to lift him up. 
There is powerful tenderness in the moment that Eli entrusts the role of prophet to Samuel and helps him clarify that God is calling, supporting him in opening his heart to God and saying, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Our invitation for this very moment is twofold. To follow the great examples of Samuel and Dr. King in paying close enough attention and opening ourselves to recognize where God may be speaking painful and powerful truth in our midst. But then also following the great examples of Eli, Coretta Scott King, and many of King's supporters, recognizing and empowering the prophets in our midst, validating God at work in them when they may have a harder time seeing it in themselves. Our psalm for today reminds us that God is often closer than we know or recognize. So let us open ourselves as servants to listen and let God speak. Amen. <laughs>